answer. He took out his stick again and moved closer to the man. I'm gonna start breaking bones one at a time. You'd better start talking. Now, where are your friends? No answer. Ozzy stood and quickly looked around. Not at Jake and the deputies, but at the house next door. Seeing nothing? He raised the stick. The man's left arm was still tied to the gas pipe, and Ozzy hit him just above the elbow. The man screamed and pulled to the left. Jake almost felt sorry for him. Where are they? Ozzy demanded. No answer. Jake turned his head as the sheriff hit the man again. Where? Are they? No answer. Ozzy raised the stick. Stop! Please, stop! The man shouted. Where are they? Down that way. About two streets. Get the cars, Ozzy ordered. Two hours later, Jake was in the sheriff's office. His wife and daughter were already on a plane to the town where Carla's parents lived, 500 miles away. Carla had returned to the house to pack, but had not spoken a word to him. There was no doubt that she blamed him for the danger they had all been in. Jake was happy that his family was alive, but still shook when he thought about what nearly happened. He smiled at Ozzy. You play rough, don't you? Only when I have to. I didn't hear you object. No, I wanted to help. What about his friend? We found him sleeping in a red pickup about a half a mile from your house. Where is he? Hospital. Same room as the other. My God, Ozzy, did you break his legs too? Jake, my friend, he did not cooperate with the police. We had to encourage him. Chapter 8 The Research Assistant After talking with Ozzy Walls, Jake went to Lucian's house. He was lonely and unhappy. He had financial problems. His wife and child had gone. He had not slept for 24 hours. When Lucian offered him a beer, he drank it quickly and accepted another and then another. By the end of the afternoon, he was drunk. By the end of the evening, he was unconscious. The next day, he woke with the worst headache he had ever had in his life. He was not a man who drank a lot. In fact, the last time he had felt like this was when he was a law student. The way he felt now reminded him of the many reasons why he did not like to drink. Later in the morning, Jake was sitting at his desk, looking out at the courthouse. He still had a bad headache and could not work. Now he had to start to prepare for the most important case of his life, with no money in the bank, a drunk law partner, a drunk psychiatrist, and this headache. He was still sitting there when he heard someone knocking at the door downstairs. He ignored it for fifteen minutes, but whoever it was knew that he was there. He walked to the window and looked out. Who is it? he shouted at the street. A woman stepped back from the sidewalk under the window and leaned on a black BMW parked next to the Saab. Her hands were deep in the pockets of old, well-fitting jeans. The midday sun lit up her gold-red hair. Are you Jake Briggins? She asked. Yes? What do you want? I need to talk to you. I'm very busy. It's very important. I just need five minutes of your time. Jake unlocked the door. She walked in and shook his hand. I'm Ellen Rourke. He pointed to a seat by the door. Nice to meet you. 
Sit down. Jake sat on the edge of Ethel's desk. One sound or two. I beg your pardon? She had a quick northeastern accent, but you could also hear she had spent some time in the south. Is it Rourke or Roark? R-O-A-R-K. That's Rourke in Boston and Roark in Mississippi. Mind if I call you Ellen? Please do. And can I call you Jake? Yes, please. Good. I hadn't planned to call you Mr. Briggins. So you come from Boston? Yes, I was born there. Went to Boston College. My dad is Sheldon Rourke, a well-known criminal lawyer in Boston. I guess I've missed him. What brings you to Mississippi? I'm in law school. Well, now that we know each other, what brings you to Clanton? Carl Lee Haley. I'm not surprised. I'll finish law school in December. I'm killing time in Oxford this summer, and I'm bored. Jake smiled and studied her carefully. What makes you think I need help? I know you practice alone, and I know you don't have a law clerk. What qualifications do you bring with you? I come from a very intelligent family. Last summer, I spent three months with the Southern Prisoners Defense Movement in Birmingham and helped with seven murder trials. In my spare time, I write reports for organizations that give free legal advice. I was brought up in my father's law office, and I was a good legal researcher before I could drive. I'm 25 years old, and when I grow up, I want to be a great criminal lawyer like my dad. Also, my father is very rich, and I've got more money than you, so I'll work without charge. A free law clerk for three weeks? I'll do all the research, typing, answering the phone. I'll even carry your papers and make the coffee. I was afraid you'd want to be a partner in my firm. No. I'm a woman, and I'm in the South. I know my place. Why are you so interested in this case? I want to be in the courtroom. I love criminal trials. Big trials, where it's a question of life or death. It's a trial lawyer's dream. I just want to be there. I'll stay out of the way, I promise. Just let me work with you and watch the trial. Judge News hates women lawyers. So does every male lawyer in the South. Besides, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a law student. I'll let you explain that to him. So I've got the job? Yes, you've got the job. I could use some free research. These cases are complicated. She gave a beautiful, confident smile. When do I start? After he had shown her around the office, it was time for lunch. So Jake took Ellen Rourke with him to the coffee shop. As they ate, he looked across at her. Her face was gentle and pleasant with an easy smile. She was not beautiful, but she was intelligent and amazingly attractive. For the first time in two days, Jake began to think he might live. They talked about his plans for the defense. Jake asked her how she would do it. Well, from what I hear, our client carefully planned the killings and shot them in cold blood six days after the rape. It sounds exactly like he knew what he was doing. Insanity is our only defense. And it sounds impossible to prove. Are you familiar with the insanity defense? Jake asked. Yes. Do we have a psychiatrist? We do and we don't. He'll say anything we want him to say. That is, if he's not drunk at the trial. One of your more difficult jobs will be to make sure that he isn't. It won't be easy, believe me. I love new experiences in the courtroom. All right, Roark. Take a pen. Your boss is now going to give you instructions. She began making notes on the paper tablecloth. Chapter 9. Preparations 
In early July, Judge Noose instructed Jean, the court clerk, to contact 150 voters as possible jury members. The defense had asked for a large number from which to select the 12, and Noose agreed. Jean and two deputy clerks spent Saturday studying the list of voters, selecting possible people. Noose also told Jean that she must not give the list to anyone, not even her old friend Jake Briggins. This trial was too important to give the clan a chance to start frightening possible jurors, or to let the lawyers start choosing the jurors before the day of jury selection. However, Judge Noose did not know about Harry Rex Vonner's ability to get hold of information. At ten o'clock the next day, Harry Rex pushed open the door of Jake's office and threw a copy of the jury list onto his desk. Don't ask, he said. Beside each name, he had made notes. Don't know. Hates niggers. Or works at the shoe factory probably against Carl Lee. Jake read each name slowly, trying to remember faces or the kind of person they were. There were only names. No addresses, ages, jobs. Most of the names sounded white. What do you think? asked Harry Rex. Hard to tell. Mostly white, but we expected that. Where did you get this? I already said, don't ask. I know 26 names. That's the best I can do. Your true friend, Harry Rex. I'm a prince. Are you ready for the trial? Not yet, but I've found a secret weapon. What? You'll meet her later. As they finished their conversation, Ellen Rourke came into the office. Good morning, Roark, Jake said. I want you to meet a good friend, Harry Rex Vonner. Harry Rex shook her hand and looked her up and down. He clearly thought she was very attractive. Nice to meet you. What was your first name? Call her Roark, Jake said. She'll clerk here until the Haley trial's finished. That's nice, said Harry Rex, still looking at Ellen, not at Jake. Harry Rex is a local lawyer, Roark, and one of the many you cannot trust. What did you hire a female law clerk for, Jake? He asked. Roark's brilliant in criminal law, like most third-year law students. And she's very cheap. Do you have something against females, sir? Ellen asked. No, ma'am. I love females. I've married four of them. She looked at his big, dirty shoes, the cheap socks that had dropped around his ankles, his dirty cotton trousers, his old dark blue jacket, his pink wool tie that fell a long way above his fat stomach, and she said to Jake, I think he's sweet. I might make you wife number five, Harry Rex said. The attraction is purely physical, she said. Careful. Jake said. There's been no sex in this office since Lucian left. How's the research? There are dozens of insanity cases, and they're all very long. I've done about half. I plan to work on the others here. Harry Rex moved toward the door. Nice meeting you, Roark. I'll see you around. Thanks, Harry Rex, said Jake. See you soon. Three miles from Jake's office was a small, neat, white country house where Ethel and Bud Twitty had lived for almost 40 years. It was a pleasant house with pleasant memories of raising children who were now living in the north. The house was quieter now. Bud hadn't worked for years, not since his first illness in 1975 when he had had a heart attack followed by two more. He knew that he would not live long, and he had accepted the fact. 
On Monday night, he sat on the front porch, listening to the football game on the radio. Ethel was working in the kitchen. Toward the end of the ball game, he heard a noise. He turned the sound down on the radio. Probably just a dog. Then another noise. He stood and looked toward the garden. Suddenly, an enormous figure in black with red, white, and black war paint across his face jumped onto the porch and pulled Bud to the ground. Bud's shout for help was not heard in the kitchen. Another man joined the first one, and they pulled the old man down the steps and into the garden. One held him, and the other hit him in the stomach and face. Within seconds, he was unconscious. Ethel heard noises and ran through the front door. She was caught by a third member of the gang, who twisted her arm violently behind her and put his hand over her mouth. She couldn't scream or talk or move, and was held there watching the two men beat her husband. On the sidewalk, ten feet behind the violence, stood three figures, each wearing the white clan robes. They came out of the darkness and watched the beating. After an impossibly long, horrible minute, the beating slowed down. Enough, said the white figure in the middle. The men left, and Ethel ran down the steps and held her unconscious husband in her arms. Jake left the hospital after midnight. Bud was still alive, but he had suffered another serious heart attack, as well as the broken bones. Ethel had shouted and screamed at Jake, blaming him for everything. You said there was no danger, she screamed. It's all your fault. Jake had looked around the small waiting room at the friends and relatives. All eyes were on him. Yes, they seemed to say. It was all his fault. Carl Lee Haley and his wife were angry, too. Gwen had no money to pay her bills, and Carl Lee had no money to pay for his defense. But they had heard that Reverend Agee had collected over $6,000 from black churchgoers to help Carl Lee. Why had they not received any of the money yet, they demanded. Jake had arranged a meeting with Reverend Agee, after Gwen visited his office to ask for help with the bills she could no longer pay. He had telephoned the reverend and asked him to come to his office to talk about the defense. Ozzie Walls had brought Carl Lee across the square, too. Reverend Agee had tried to frighten Carl Lee, to tell him he was ungrateful. The church was keeping the money for any future defense. Ozzie helped the reverend to see that he was making a mistake. I agree with Carl Lee and Gwen. Reverend A.G., you ain't done right, and you know it. That hurts, Ozzy, coming from you. It really hurts. Let me tell you what's gonna hurt a lot more than that. Next Sunday, Carl Lee and I will be in your church. Carl Lee will do the talking. He'll tell all your people that the money they've given so generously has not left your pocket. That Gwen and the children are gonna lose their house because you're keeping the money people gave. He'll tell them that you lied to them. He may talk for an hour or so. When he's finished, I'll say a few words. I'll tell them what a lying, dishonest nigger you are. I'll tell them about the time you bought that stolen car in Memphis for a hundred dollars and almost got sent to jail. I'll tell them about the money you get from the funeral business. And, Reverend, I'll tell... Don't say it, Ozzy, A.G. begged. I'll tell them a dirty little secret that only you and me and a certain woman of bad character know about. When do you want the money? As soon as you can get it, Carl Lee demanded. Ozzie 
could be very persuasive sometimes.